sometimes I like to see how long I can go in these vlogs without talking. And today it is this point in the video, about a minute 35 in. It's just a little game I like to play with myself. And I don't mean that in a weird way. This is a quick little project for a client. This is, I believe, oak veneer plywood. It's just some shop core, a little bit rough on the inside when it was cut. I don't think the tool is at all dull. I think it just sometimes tears in this weird way. Uh, I was using a Vortex 3110, and that's pretty much our go-to for stuff like this. It's a quarter-inch compression tool. I think it was 450 inches a minute at 18 or 19,000 RPMs. If for some reason you've jumped into the vlog at number 16, then you probably don't understand how our work holding works or you haven't seen a machine like this. We use a vacuum flow through through the bed of the CNC and that holds the parts down. So it goes through the MDF there uh, underneath the table and there's a vacuum in that room behind the sheets of plywood there in the back. And that holds our plywood in place. It's seemingly magical. Uh, it still kind of amazes me to some degree. And that gauge we saw a little bit earlier actually measures the vacuum pressure on a scale from one to 10. I think I've mentioned it before, but that vacuum gauge, we actually made, Chris came up with the idea and you see in the upper left corner there, it's got a few problems still. It seems to keep timing out and getting stuck, but we're really excited about its potential because we really haven't had a good way to visually tell what the vacuum pressure is. So how much pressure we have, because every time you cut through, and you allow gaps in what you're pulling down through the material, you're losing vacuum pressure and you kind of get gaslit into not understanding what the real pressure is because most of it's by hearing. For big plywood parts like the front of the machine here, you won't have any problems with hold down with our setup, but in the back, those little parts are tabbed together because they would come up. Just to illustrate this point a little more, watch as I turn off the vacuum hold, which is dropped, and you can see it drop pretty precipitously up there. The idea is that eventually we'll be able to watch this gauge, which it actually was working pretty well there, and know whether or not we're going to lose parts by calibrating it to what we know is a problematic uh, pressure drop. Damn spoil board is super warped. It's driving me crazy, but there's really nothing you can do besides glue it down or surface it, and I don't really care to do that for this small project. So we get these tool holders really cheap on Amazon and uh, with cheap comes potential issues of course. Uh, we found them to be really good. We probably have close to 15 or 20 now. Get them in packs of, of uh, five or you can get them by one at a time. And I have some friends that run them too and they actually are really good for most of what we do. I'm finding right now that I'm getting about two tenths run out, which is really awesome. Um, and I have this Shars gauge and then a little kind of yoga arm here clamped to a block. And I just get it up, <clears throat> put in my tool holder, of course. Get it somewhere where I know I can run it consistently. That nut isn't all the way tight, but it's not the greatest run out. That's usually not the thing we're most concerned about though, because that's not actually touching the tool. Um, yeah, that's almost like five tenths. So that's, yeah, it's not great, but it's the nut. It doesn't really matter that much. So we take the nut off 
what we want is really concentric uh, surfaces on the cone on the inside for one and then you usually do something on the outside too. So that's like a tenth if this is actually accurate enough to read that. Yeah, maybe half a tenth. That's really really good. This one's awesome. So I'll measure the outside just to confirm. Essentially all I'm doing is just running the little finger up to the surface in a way that it plunges and spinning the spindle by hand. I'm getting the same thing about a tenth. Anyway, I'll put a link to these. We've found them to be really awesome tool holders. Um, if you need something really accurate, this isn't probably what you should use, but we test them when we first get them in. We don't let them go out to production. I mean, this is, we've been using this one for significant time. It's great. It's really hard to spend. This is the old Chinese versus America made products problem. This is an $140 tool holder. It's not significantly different in our, in our measurements. Uh, they typically are more reliably accurate, but for a lot of what we do, people don't care about tenths. They care about maybe a 16th. So for the money, these are uh, $33 typically. If you get them at a pack of five, I think they come down to 22 or 25 bucks. Can't really beat that. Um, so. I'll put a link to those in the description. Uh, we get them on my Amazon. They're pretty great. This is just the Shars 10th. Uh, what is that? I don't. I don't know what the hell. It's a Shars gauge. This whole setup was like 60 bucks, I think. It's really worth it. If you're gonna buy cheap tools, you might as well have something to know that they're cheap. Uh, so make sure you tighten the nuts or the pole studs. Sorry, when you get them, put them in your vise. Tighten those babies and they usually come loose. And you don't want that going up into your changer. Yeah, if you have a ISO 30 spindle, this is a great option.
As I wrap up this Ash Glue Up, I want to remind you about our intro to CNC and CAM course. It's an online course that will cover the basics of CNC and CAM. You can go at your own pace and pick up some good beginner knowledge. We're taking pre-orders now. We just made an option to pay over three months. No interest or funny business. It just splits the full amount over three months. Check it out. I'll link that below.